Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Air Canada suspends 30 routes and leaves eight Canadian airports. It's a real step backwards in terms of connecting our region to the world. What it means for folks from Atlantic Canada to the prairies. At the end of the day, we are protecting each other here. New rules for most Ontario residents, mandatory mask wearing in indoor public spaces. There's no crystal ball that says that this is going to cause a pandemic. Assessing the risk of a new strain of flu. And John Bolton talks to us about Meng Wanzhou, China, and the two Michaels. Obviously, they were picking on Canada uh, rather than arresting American citizens. Why he signed on with Trump and why he bailed. This is The National. After months of financial devastation to Canada's airline industry, COVID-19 landed another hard blow today. Air Canada is scrapping indefinitely 30 routes across the country and it is shutting down operations in at least eight regional airports. Now at Atlanta, Canada, 14 routes are being abandoned along with two Air Canada stations. Quebec loses eight routes and four regional stations. In Ontario, four routes suspended, stations closed at two airports. And finally, Saskatchewan and Manitoba lose four routes, including flights to Ottawa. Now, with total losses approaching $2 billion, Air Canada says it simply cannot afford to keep those planes in the air. But as Cameron McIntosh explains, the cuts have big consequences for those on the ground. They may be some of Air Canada's lowest volume, lowest profit routes, but to people who rely on them, they matter. So when Charlottetown loses service to Halifax, the world gets smaller. We do know it's, you know, close to 10% of our traffic goes through that route. Or more isolated, places like Valdor, Quebec, or Newfoundland and Labrador's Deer Lake. You know, so it's 14 routes within our region, and 12 of those are what we would call interregional. It's a real step backwards in terms of connecting our region to the world, and we're disappointed about that. Air Canada says it's lost more than a billion dollars in the first quarter. It's already laid off 20,000 staff and sidelined 79 aircraft. This is, I'm sure, not the end of it. This analyst says he expected the cuts sooner, thinks airlines will chase more profitable routes as travel resumes. But I think fares will go up quite a bit when they start coming again. He expects competitors like WestJet will be making similar moves. In Windsor, Ontario, which is losing its Air Canada flight to Montreal, the mayor suspects his airport will see more cuts. I imagine that there will be a lot of folks uh, that aren't comfortable flying for the rest of this year uh, and that they will have to adjust and adapt like everyone else is doing. Meanwhile, Air Canada's moves cutting off many communities in Quebec and Atlantic Canada could put pressure on Ottawa to help out the airline. So uh, no doubt cutting those routes might have been part of the calculus, but I suspect it was really more just cost uh, really than po politics per se. As airlines suffer, so does the rest of the travel industry. Back at the Charlottetown airport. I think it really just underscores, um, you know, the severity of uh, what's happening in our industry. Air Canada itself says it may not be done yet. It could be years before it pulls itself out of its pandemic nosedive. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Of course, businesses big and small have been hit very hard the past few months, but new numbers suggest the worst may be over. Have a look. March was rough as the economy dropped by 7.5%, but rock bottom came in April, down a whopping 11.6% with every sector taking a hit. By that month's end, the Canadian economy has shed almost one-fifth of its output. We don't have May's final figures yet, but StatsCan's early estimate is a GDP up 3% from those deep depths. So even a fragile economic recovery depends on keeping COVID numbers down, with masks now widely considered among the best weapons in that fight. Yuan Ermiliotis looks at the drive to make them mandatory across Canada's biggest metropolitan region. Thursday, they will be mandatory. In Toronto's transit system, masks will soon be a new reality, here and in every enclosed space in the city. We know we are at a critical time in the fight against COVID-19, and that we must do everything we can to avoid the flare-ups that we've seen in other places. Across the greater Toronto area, one mayor after another is making masks mandatory in indoor public places, or planning to. 
in Markham at a drive-in movie event. Great to see so many of you out here. Mayor uh, Frank Scarpiti says safe distancing is one rule. Masks should be another. Do we say that seat belts are highly recommended? I mean, at the end of the day, we are protecting each other here. The growing evidence that masks can protect from transmitting and catching the virus is proof here. After dozens of staff got infected, Longo's enforced a mask policy for everyone in its grocery stores two months ago. We think that wearing the masks of team members and customers has made a big difference in that, that we're not getting the transmission within the store. So, uh, so we're really happy that we made that decision. And while that decision will become law in more places, most provinces, including Ontario, aren't calling for a blanket policy. But as restrictions ease and with a second wave on the horizon, a growing call from medical experts that a recommendation alone is not enough. I think if we give people advice on when it's recommended and when you could or you should, it still leaves it very much open to judgment and, and it's a bit wishy-washy. And what we need now is clarity as to what we're expected to do. From subways to shops, officials are relying on compliance rather than enforcement. With the expectation, the clearer the rules, the more likely people will follow them. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. And masks will soon be mandatory on all public transit routes in Quebec. Until now, Quebec had preferred to strongly recommend that riders use masks or face coverings. Effective July 27th, anyone over the age of 12 must wear one. Ottawa has extended the travel ban on most foreign visitors entering the country. The order will now stretch until at least the end of July. It bans travelers who aren't either Canadian citizens, permanent residents, or people entering from the U.S. for essential reasons. A separate order prohibiting non-essential travel between Canada and the U.S. still in effect until July 21st. And beginning July 1st, Canadians can travel to the EU. In a bid to boost much-needed tourism, the European Council today approved a list of 15 safe countries, Canada among them, considered to have contained COVID-19. But because of soaring infection rates, the U.S. is not on that list. And so, a dire warning today from the top infectious diseases expert in the United States. Dr. Anthony Fauci says the number of new coronavirus cases could more than double if Americans don't change their behavior. As it is, the recent surge in cases means about 40,000 people are getting sick every day in the U.S. Dr. Fauci is concerned that number of new daily infections could get as high as 100,000. The CBC's Paul Hunter has more from Washington. Even as COVID infections in the U.S. now surge, pressure to ease up on rules aimed at fighting the pandemic grows. Our bills are due, our rent is due, our car notes are due. Texas, like other states that had been reopening businesses, is now seeing a COVID spike, setting another infection record today, and it's clamping down again. Florida's home to its own infection surge with fears this coming holiday weekend that crowds at those beaches staying open could supercharge the spread of the virus. We're going in the wrong direction. Dr. Anthony Fauci, lead scientist in America's battle against COVID, today on Capitol Hill with a sobering prediction about this country's rate of infections. We are now having 40 plus thousand new cases a day I would not be surprised if we go up to 100,000 a day if this does not turn around. And so I am very concerned. It didn't have to be this way. In Delaware today, Joe Biden slammed the White House for its COVID response and what he called the president's historic mismanagement. Month after month, as other leaders in other countries took the necessary steps to get the virus under control, Donald Trump failed us. In return, the Trump campaign called Biden a fearmonger. Though, at the same time, it cancelled a planned rally by Trump this weekend in Alabama, citing COVID. As medical experts effectively pleaded with Americans to wear a mask and especially to steer clear of crowds. There's going to be a lot of hurt if that does not stop. Fauci hinted at progress toward a vaccine, but he emphasized there are still no guarantees. And as those infections grow, said Fauci, the entire country is at risk. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. 
Donald Trump has boasted no one has done more for the U.S. military. But after reports that Russia may have paid militants to hunt and kill coalition soldiers in Afghanistan, including Americans, Trump is taking fire for doing nothing. And Kitty Simpson explains, for critics, the White House response isn't reassuring. The president was never briefed on this. Um, this intelligence still has not been verified, um, and there is no consensus among the intelligence community. Repeated denials from the White House are satisfying few in Washington. Even some of the president's allies are openly questioning how the administration handled the alleged Russian bounty plot. If I was president, I absolutely would want to know. If I was briefing the president, I would probably uh, brief him to that extent. Some U.S. intelligence officials believe Russia paid Taliban fighters to kill American and coalition soldiers in Afghanistan. The New York Times says it was concern enough to be included in one of Donald Trump's daily written intelligence briefings in late February. But Trump's denial of knowing anything about it amid reports he doesn't read his briefings has Democrats again saying he's unfit for office. So the idea that somehow he didn't know or isn't being briefed it is a dereliction of duty if that's the case. And if he was briefed and nothing was done about this, that's a dereliction of duty. It's credible the president wouldn't know a lot of things. In an interview with Adrian Arsenault, Trump's former national security advisor says the president is not detail-oriented. I don't think it's the way a president should behave in important international geostrategic affairs, uh, but that's the way he does things. The White House isn't saying whether Trump read that specific briefing, but insists he's doing his job. The president does read, and he also consumes intelligence oh, yeah, verbally. This president, I'll tell you, is the most informed person on planet Earth when it comes to the threats that we face. If the allegations are proven to be true, some Republicans and Democrats are urging the White House to take new action against Russia. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. There is more about Trump's fitness for office and about how Canada's troubles with China play into his calculus from someone who saw him in action. My full interview with John Bolton is coming up in about 20 minutes. Donald Trump may not be known for criticizing the Kremlin, but on the eve of a referendum that would allow Vladimir Putin to remain as president until 2036 and ban gay marriage, Canada has voiced concerns. But as Chris Brown explains, that didn't go over well in Moscow. Insults and over-the-top outrage is standard for Russia state TV talk shows, but this episode was especially ferocious, with the target Canada's ambassador to Moscow. People like her will be banished to hell, where they'll burn eternally, screamed the deputy speaker of Russia's parliament. Ambassador Alison Leclerc flew a rainbow flag outside of Canada's embassy and posted this video to mark June as Pride Month. But she also included a comment on Russia's about to be adopted ban on gay marriage. And proposals for constitutional amendments that, if adopted, would lead to an increasingly less inclusive national legal framework. When she gives directions on voting, said the Kremlin connected journal editor, that's not the role of a diplomat. She should be reprimanded. The amendments would allow Vladimir Putin to remain as president practically until he dies. But they'll also entrench so-called traditional conservative values into the Constitution. I will repeat it again. While I'm president, we will not have parent number one and parent number two, said Putin. It will be mom and dad. At St. Petersburg's Rainbow Cafe, Karina Kuznetsova and her partner Yulia Potikina say while a growing number of Russians believe gay people should have equal rights, it still feels like they're decades away from being completely accepted. This will take us back to the 16th century is how I see it. There's practically no doubt the Kremlin will get its way when the votes are counted Wednesday. Copies of the new constitution have already been published. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. In Hong Kong, pro-democracy activists protested after China passed new national security legislation today. It gives Beijing sweeping new powers and has led to widespread international condemnation. More than 300,000 Canadians live in Hong Kong. 
And Facebook says it has agreed to an audit of how it controls hate speech. This promise comes after major advertisers said they would pause their Facebook ads to pressure the company to do more to take hate speech down. The scope and timing of the audit are still being finalized. The social media giant also banned hundreds of accounts, groups, and pages today associated with the so-called Boogaloo movement. That's a loosely organized network considered extremist and violent in the United States. As Thomas Douglas shows us, it has a presence in Canada as well. And you will know my name is the Lord. Floral shirts and guns, two signatures of the so-called Boogaloo Boys. We just do a little yoink. And then they pull this out. Organized online, the movement mostly stayed out of sight until supporters started showing up heavily armed at U.S. anti-lockdown protests and Black Lives Matter demonstrations. They stand for gun rights and keep preparing for an anti-government uprising. It's really easy to look at somebody in a Hawaiian shirt and think, this is silly, this is not really a threat. They're attempting to bring about a civil war. This is not funny. Now, CBC News has found Boogaloo support is spreading into Canada with two Facebook groups and hundreds of members. This one taken down after CBC brought it to Facebook's attention. A user in another group sharing the image of a rifle with a grenade launcher dubbed a gun designed for ending the Canadian menace. The fear is that they now take uh, a page from the book of, of their American counterparts. The administrator of the Facebook group tells CBC he runs the page for the memes and humor. But consider, after two officers were killed in California, authorities say they found this boogaloo patch belonging to the alleged shooter. In Nevada, three supporters were arrested, accused of planning a firebomb attack. Governments should be concerned uh, because, you know, these days there, there's, you know, people need very little to do a whole lot of damage. Members of those Canadian groups appeared especially enraged when the government further restricted gun ownership. For now, they haven't moved to any real world violence here, but online threats don't always remain virtual. Thomas Dagg, Le CBC News, Toronto. An Edmonton man is back in custody tonight after people spent nearly two weeks protesting his release on bail. Wade Steen is accused of sexually assaulting an eight-year-old, and police alerted the public to his presence even though he hasn't been convicted. Rafi Bujikanyan has the result. Open up, sitting in your bathtub, cowarding like the coward you are. For nearly two weeks, Zach Gladu has been among the protesters upset over Wade Steen's release. Justice system has failed us way too many times. Steen was arrested, then released on bail after he was charged with kidnapping and sexually assaulting an eight-year-old girl. He'd been staying in the neighborhood where the alleged crime occurred. If he was in a hotel room where it wasn't in the same area, I don't think there would be an issue. Their viewpoint gained traction on social media, and they claimed support from beyond Canada's borders. Today, a judge revoked the bail application. Steen's lawyer says his client is relieved to return to custody. I ask that uh, the protesters essentially be dispersed. I understand that hasn't occurred. And they made themselves heard the moment Steen was escorted off the premises. neighbors relieved too. You think your community is safe. You never believe it's going to happen to you until it does. And when it does, um, it hits you like a rock. Wade's gotta go! But police experts worry today's events could be setting a dangerous precedent. What struck me is the, what, what I seem as, as the emboldening of vigilantism. And I, I think a lot of this is uh, the result of the social media and how quickly stories are spread. One of the foundations in, in Canadian uh, justice system is the fact that someone is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Late tonight, the family of Steen's alleged victim expressed relief and gratitude, saying it looks forward to a quieter neighborhood while it waits for future court proceedings. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Well, a new virus in China has just made the jump from animals to humans, and scientists say it has pandemic potential. The question is, are there any 
evidence of human to human transmission. Up next, the good news. We'll take you through what we actually know and what scientists could learn from it. And after leaving the room where it happened, John Bolton sat down with me. The president misses a lot of things. He's not, as they say, a detail person. What he saw, why he left, and what was being said in the White House about the Meng Wanzhou extradition case. The president thinks everything is negotiable. That's part of the problem. My interview with Donald Trump's former national security advisor coming up. We're back in two. The last thing anyone wants to hear right now as the world fights COVID-19 is that there's a new swine flu out there that also has pandemic potential. But as Christine Birak tells us, while that may be true, scientists are saying the virus is not an immediate threat. The new flu virus lives in pigs. It's being called G4. While viruses like it have jumped from pigs to people, most do not go on to spread between people. But a new study is suggesting this one could. While there's no immediate threat, Chinese scientists say G4 has all the essential hallmarks of a candidate pandemic virus. A spokesman for China's foreign ministry says it's following developments uh, and will take all necessary measures to prevent the spread and outbreak of any virus. There's no crystal ball that says that this is going to cause a pandemic. Um, you know, I think what's really important is to do this kind of surveillance. Between 2011 and 2018, Chinese researchers analyzed 30,000 nasal swabs from pigs at slaughterhouses in 10 provinces. They found nearly 200 swine flu viruses. Most of them were G4. Researchers also found five possible human cases, mainly in pig farmers. You know, it's one thing to have a virus. But it's still not clear if the virus made them sick and... You know, what we really need to see more of is evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. Not yet, but the genetic makeup of the G4 virus includes the H1N1 strain that led to the swine flu pandemic in 2009. H1N1 has since killed as many as half a million people worldwide, and it's still circulating. We know that we're going to see another influenza pandemic at some time in the future. That's guaranteed. Unlike the current coronavirus pandemic, scientists do understand a lot more about flu viruses and developing vaccines for them. And it helps to know what kind of threats may be coming down the road. It's only by this ongoing surveillance that we can at least begin to understand, study and prepare ourselves. He adds, the only thing predictable about flu viruses like G4 is that they're unpredictable. Christine Birak, CBC News. Toronto. Now, as COVID-19 restrictions continue to ease across Canada, one profession has really had to go above and beyond when it comes to finding a way to reopen safely, all to keep your teeth clean. Dentists have all kinds of new precautions that they need to take in order to reopen, and it turns out patients have new obligations as well. So what should you expect? Well, before you get your teeth cleaned, you may actually have to get your temperature checked. You'll also have to answer some basic questions about potential COVID symptoms you have. How did I do? 35.9. Okay, Frida, thank you very much. Uh, you'll have to wash your hands, wear a mask, and as for the waiting room, it may be off limits altogether. We just want to ensure that patients don't cross paths as they're coming and going to keep them as safe as possible. Then there's the appointment itself. Staff will be wearing even more protective gear than they usually do. So, uh, for example, in addition to um, eye protection, you may see that the dentist and dental staff are also wearing face shields. Now, obviously, once you're in, you can't keep your mask on. So your dentist may actually ask you to use a hydrogen peroxide rinse just to pre-clean your mouth. Then come the changes you may not even notice. So we've really beefed up the HVAC system in the office to purify the air as much as possible. So once we're done treating patients, we have to close the door. We have to let the air be purified before we can reopen the door to come back in to disinfect and sterilize the room and get it ready for the next patient. If the dentist doesn't have a way of circulating or filtering the air, then they'll have to leave the room empty for three hours between patients, depending on the procedure. That's important because so much of what a dentist does in your mouth generates aerosol. Everything from this water spray gun 
to high-speed drills, to the ultrasonic scaler that vibrates the junk off your teeth. And it's not like the dentist can keep physically distanced from your wide open mouth. So yes, a lot of these protective measures in place are to protect the staff here, but they're also here to protect you from the other patients who were in the room just before. When we come back, step inside the room where it happened. My interview with Donald Trump's former national security advisor. It was difficult and frustrating, but almost for that reason, it was an incentive to stay on. Why John Bolton stayed, why he left, and what was being said inside the White House as Canada arrested Meng Wanzhou and China arrested two Canadians. Welcome back. Even before his year-long stint as Donald Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton had a reputation. A foreign policy hawk, abrasive and combative, adept at getting what he wants in Washington. And all that has made him enemies, including now the president of the United States, after he pushed ahead with the publication of his White House memoir. For critics who wonder whether Trump's presidency undermines itself or the entire country, John Bolton's answer is yes. If the book gets out, he's broken the law. And I would think that he would have criminal problems. I hope so. This is the book that Donald Trump tried to prevent Americans from reading. John Bolton's far from kind assessment of Donald Trump's presidency. That's highly classified information. This guy's writing things about conversations. And maybe he's not telling the truth. He's been known not to tell the truth a lot. The book is filled with accusations against Trump, calling the president, quote, stunningly uninformed, unfit for office, and a danger to the republic. Once an ambassador to the United Nations, John Bolton also served three previous American presidents. You are going to do a fantastic job, and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. On April 9th, 2018, Bolton became Donald Trump's third national security advisor in 15 months. In his book, Bolton says he quickly saw a president who only cared about re-election, adding that, quote, obstruction of justice was a way of life, and that Trump gave, quote, personal favors to dictators he liked. Bolton's book has done the unheard of in Washington. He's managed to unite both Republicans and Democrats in their anger. My take on him, it's, it's big lie Bolton, it's book deal Bolton. He's doing it for the money, that's pretty clear. He chose royalty over patriotism, and so he's gonna make money off of his book, I guess. We also have questions of our own about Trump's relationship with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. I spoke with Ambassador John Bolton earlier this afternoon. Ambassador, thank you for taking time for us today. I, I wanted to start, if I could, with the White House briefing yesterday because the press secretary told reporters that President Trump had never been briefed about these reports of Russian bounties being paid to the Taliban to kill U.S. or coalition troops. Can you set the record straight for us, please? Well, I can't uh, really comment on news reports that have come out about, uh, about my briefing the president. What I think I can say uh, is that this uh, possible threat by the Russians is something uh, that needs to be taken seriously if the information bears out. The Russians want the U.S. and, and uh, coalition forces uh, out of Afghanistan, out of Iraq, out of Syria, out of Eastern and Central Europe if they can get away with it, out of Ukraine, out of a lot of places. Uh, and a direct threat to American service members and, and obviously to others in the coalition uh, is something that, uh, that really one cannot blink at. Now, if evaluation of information has to take place, great, let's have the evaluation, but let's also act on it if it turns out to be serious. Did you ever brief the president on it? <laughs> you know, I just, uh, uh, one, one day I'll say no comment and the, the press will take that to mean no comment. I'll be a happy man. Is it credible, though, that the president would not know this? Uh, it, it's credible the president wouldn't know a lot of things. I try and explain in the book. It, I'm sure, is mystifying to many people. But the president misses a lot of things. He's not, as they say, a detail person. Um, maybe that's the way he was successful at real estate. I don't think it's the way a president should behave in important international geostrategic affairs. Uh, but that's the way he does things. It, uh, in the book, you know, it, it's pretty striking to hear you, you talk about how uh, Trump 
is, in your estimation, a danger to the republic. What, what was the moment where you felt that first? Well, it was a, it was a growing sensation. I, I didn't have one particular eureka moment. It was sort of a long succession of disappointments and, uh, and growing concern. Uh, I'm very confident, by the way, that, uh, that the United States can survive uh, a one-term Trump presidency. I think we can correct the damage that's been done. Uh, but certainly in the national security field uh, where I'm concerned, I think the damage has been considerable, although reparable. I just don't want to see more happening. This will be, by the way, the first time in my adult life that I will not vote for a Republican for president. I, you know, I'm interested, as a Canadian, you know, you do write about Canada and here, and, and you particularly write about the arrest of Meng Wanzhou. I, I'm curious, why was Canada asked to arrest her, and not other countries that also have extradition treaties with the United States? Well, part of the dilemma for any law enforcement exercise is you have to make sure your case is ripe before you uh, try and arrest somebody. So I think the logistics simply were that uh, at, the, at the time the decision was made, it was uh, learned that she was going to get on a flight to Vancouver, uh, and that's when the request for extradition uh, was made. I, I understand that. I'm, I am curious, though. I, I have copies of her passport here. The arrest um, was sworn and sealed on August 22nd. She was picked up in Canada in December. But there are stamps in this passport between that time for the UK, for France, for Belgium. All these countries have extradition treaties with the United States. You know, I can't answer the question. It's not something that, uh, that uh, I would normally be familiar with in any case. It wasn't because we were trying to put some burden on Canada. Being an alumnus of the Justice Department myself, I know a lot of these things are, are purely logistical. This is not a political uh, decision by the Justice Department. I, I think you can appreciate why I'm asking, though, because uh, from this side of the border, there, there is, I, I suppose, a, a perception that Canada might have been played as the country most likely to be compliant. I'd have, to, I'd have to believe that that's, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it that way at all. You, um, f further in the book, I think page, yeah, 308, you, uh, you write about Mike Pence, uh, Pompeo, yourself pressuring Trudeau to stand firm on the extradition. What, what did that look like? Well, I don't think we pressured him at all. I think he was quite rightly concerned that China had taken custody of two Canadian citizens for no reason at all. In fact, I think arrested one of them in the middle of the night, broke into his apartment. Uh, and that's an example, and this was certainly an argument that, uh, that I made in, in conversations with uh, Canadians and others. If this is the way China behaves now, imagine how they'll behave when they become even more powerful. Obviously, they were picking on Canada uh, rather than arresting American citizens. I don't consider that pressuring Canada. I thought it was reassuring Canada we weren't going to let the Chinese get away with this. And so it's 560 plus days now that Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig ha have been in detention. When you said that, that the matter of their detention would be brought up at every opportunity, what did you actually do? The State Department has been raising it, and it's uh, been spoken of publicly in the administration, including uh, after I left. Uh, Meng has been fighting her extradition very vigorously. That has certainly dragged things out for a long period of time. Uh, but I think uh, it would be a mistake to say that somehow there's an equivalency between uh, arresting somebody for committing massive financial fraud for violation of the American sanctions against Iran versus China just arbitrarily arresting two Canadian citizens for no reason whatever. You know, as a Canadian, I'm also an American, but, but as an, a Canadian, you see that Prime Minister Trudeau seems to go out of his way to not upset the president. Has, has that been noticed at all? Well, I think uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not easy for any foreign leader, especially from American allies, uh, to deal with this anomalous president. And uh, they've each behaved in their own ways. And uh, uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has behaved in a uh, responsible fashion. But is the United States at this point a reliable ally for Canada under this president? 
look, the, the fundamental relations between two countries uh, really do transcend the vagaries e even of an election of a national leader. Uh, and that's why I think that the uh, negative consequences caused by the Trump presidency can be overcome. The position of the United States in the world uh, has not fundamentally changed. Those who are anti-American will pick on Trump as an example of America uh, in decline, and they would be wrong. You have a unique window in, into the operations uh, of this administration. Why should Canada put its citizens, uh, its trade, at risk for a, a country and a leader who, who seems unwilling to return the favor? Look, if, if you want to disavow the United States, if you want to leave NATO, if you want to get rid of our protection militarily, please feel free to go ahead and do it. Canada can do that if that's what you want. The issue here in dealing with China is whether free countries will stand together against this authoritarian threat uh, or they won't. We're going to stick, I hope, with a consistent policy of trying to prevent China from taking advantage uh, of its economic clout, which is what it's trying to do now uh, in this present controversy. How does Canada get its Canadians home from China at this point? Uh, look, I think we all want to get them home as soon as possible. America's had its share of hostages around the world as well. I if you don't like it, ma'am, you're, you're free to go ally with China, if that's what you think your country wants to do. Think about that long and hard. Sorry, I'm actually asking for a some analysis on, on what the right approach might be. You, you, you've got to take a long-term perspective. What the Chinese have done is outrageous. There's no question about it. Uh, what do you think they will do if you give in to that behavior? Let me ask you a question. Well, that's the advantage of sitting where I am right now, is I'm asking you for analysis. I think Canadians feel like they're out of good ideas at this point and they're looking for some. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Thank you for your time. I hope we didn't take too much of it. Still ahead on The National, remembering Carl Reiner, we look at the classic comedian's legacy. Plus how COVID-19 closures are hitting the LGBTQ community. It kills me because that was our home. That was our only place. It was our only safe place. The loss of gay bars in cities across the country. We'll be right back. Sometimes a bar is more than just a bar. Small businesses like bars and restaurants have been buckling under the pandemic, including gay bars. In good times, they provide a place where people are free to be themselves. So Kayla Hounsell looks at the impact as those safe spaces shut down. This side, you want that depth? Today, Rouge Fatal is teaching. Usually during Pride Month, she's performing. But the pandemic has changed things and forced the closure of her main stage. It kills me because that was our home. That was our only place. It was our only safe place. Halifax's men's and Molly's closed in April. It was the city's only dedicated gay bar. Likewise, Fredericton's Boom nightclub closed last weekend. It's pretty profound and pretty important to, to make sure that everybody understands not just why it's a safe space. It's not that it has a lock or, or the windows are secure. Um, it's not a physical safety. It's an emotional safety space. Amour Love is the reigning boom queen. The pandemic means virtual only performances for now, but even when other establishments start welcoming audiences back, she says it won't be the same. I can almost guarantee that when I do go out to any other bar other than a gay bar, I will get looked at, talked about, or pointed at at least five to six times before I even take my coat off. In Regina, the LGBTQ social club is hanging on. The bills mounted and the bills kept growing. Hugh Nightclub is owned and operated by the community. A GoFundMe page to help with pandemic bills raised nearly $25,000 in two weeks. I've seen donations and messages from people from, that haven't been here for 15 years that talk about how much this place meant to them when they were coming out. It terrifies me. Rouge Fatal says the importance of a club, especially for people who are just coming out, cannot be overstated. It's scary when you don't have a church. 
you know, and to some folks, this that was their haven. That was their place to go to be protected, to be safe, to know that they weren't going to be judged. For performers, it's also a loss of income, but they say they will persevere and look for ways to create new safe spaces. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Next on The National, remembering Carl Reiner. The word like cheese, what's the origin of the word? Cheese came from the first man who discovered cheese. He looked into a big barrel, see, mm -hmm. of souring milk, milk that was souring, mm -hmm. and he sniffed it and he went, cheese! A master of his craft, his comedic legacy, next. Carl Reiner made people laugh for well over six decades and barely slowed down in the last few. Last night he died at the age of 98 and now he's being remembered as a television pioneer and the man, be man behind a landmark sitcom. His son, the noted actor and director Rob Reiner, tweeted today, last night my dad passed away. As I write this, my heart is hurting. He was my guiding light. Eli Glasner looks back on a long lifetime of achievement. Carl Reiner's talent was to make the people around him funnier. He made his mark on Sid Caesar's variety show as a straight man with a serious funny bone. That's not spaghetti, sir. That's spaghetti. <laughs> his time with Caesar became the basis of his creation, The Dick Van Dyke Show, where he played the blowhard boss. Alan, if you're going to have lunch and get to that meeting, you better get going. Shut up, Mel. <laughs> what are you doing to my chair? But it was another Mel who changed his career. Brooks was an up-and-coming comedian. One day, Reiner fed him a question that would inspire a hit record. Here is a man who was actually at the scene of the crucifixion 2,000 years ago. Isn't that true, sir? And first words out of Mel was, oh, boy. Yeah, oh, boy, it was terrible. So you knew Jesus? He says, yeah, it came in the store. And even though they've rehearsed this act and they've polished it, there are moments where Brooks starts to lean in a direction and, and Reiner sees it and goes with it. Yeah. And you can feel the joy. Later, Reiner moved behind the scenes. Hey, hey harnessing the manic talents of Steve Martin in a series of successful films. More recently, Reiner had a recurring role in the Ocean's Eleven heist movies. So you're going to tell me, or should I just say no and get it over with? Their boss. Comedian Sean Collins says Reiner comes from a generation that put the laughs first. It never was about, oh, how smart that Carl Reiner is. He's, a, he's so insightful. I don't think he ever worried about that. And... I believe that the, it takes someone incredibly intelligent to be that stupid, to do that kind of stupid silliness and own it, you know. Even in their 90s, the silliness between Mel Brooks and Reiner continued. They met nightly to eat, watch movies, and kibitz. It was just last Sunday Reiner's manager shared a photo of the always outspoken Reiner with his daughter and Mel. Today, Brooks echoed the sentiments of many of Reiner's friends, calling him a giant who will be greatly missed. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, one man's seriously intricate Canada Day project in our moment. But first, Andrew has some special programming to tell you about tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be a big day planned for tomorrow. We've got a special program planned to celebrate Canada Day 2020. It is going to be very different than what any of us is used to as the global pandemic keeps us apart, but we will bring the country to you with a focus on celebrating those Canadians on the front lines, keeping this country healthy, fed and safe during pretty uncertain times. We're going to have some big surprises too. So join us at 11 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Network and CBC Gem. Luanga Nuami has been creating cardboard installations since he was a teenager. He's made board games for his kids, even a swimming pool, all out of cardboard, and now he's trying something new. He's calling his new cardboard project Beautiful Canada, his way of paying tribute to this country, and that is our moment. I've been hardcore into making things out of uh, cardboard since I was a teenager. During this pandemic that all of us have had to go through, it gave me a lot of time to think about the country that uh, I was born in and has lived in all 43 years of my life. I started researching and realizing that every province and territory has beautiful landscapes. They're all unique. And I wanted to create like a love letter to Canada 
that just hit me after I started looking at some pictures and made BC and then made Alberta, then Yukon, Northwest, and I just kept on going. New Brunswick has the world's largest axe. I think that's a cool thing to have and the world's largest lobster. So okay, I have to add in those. I plan how many layers I want, usually five layers. I intricately cut out each one. Each one would take about two to three hours to complete. I made this for Canadians to embrace their own nation and have something unique and special for this quite dreary year that has been 2020. Wow. Dr dreary year. <laughs> uh, these are not dreary. He has mm. made one of these for each of the premiers. He's giving them to them. Uh, he's making a hundred of each one and then distributing them and then he's done. Cool. And, the, and the nice touch is that each one inside each booklet says 100% made in Canada because uh, obviously the everything's Canadian. The, the idea, the, the image, but also the cardboard, <laughs> the glue. Amazing. All of it. That's The National for this Tuesday, June 30th. Good night. Good night.